Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And you're listening to episode 72. And this episode, we are continuing a little bit. Uh, this is sort of a uh, epilogue, postscript, however you want, of our previous episode where we talked about uh, several creators in video games that started out as fans or things that they have made that started out as fan projects that made good, that went pro. And in talking about that, we also uh, realized and remembered that there are several franchises, genres, game experiences that all started as, I guess they started as mods. And it's amazing the things that we now like that are now multi-million dollar uh, properties that started out as somebody tweaking something specific in an already established game and making a whole new experience. Yeah, for sure. I mean, honestly, I think probably one of the most famous ones is if you've played League of Legends, Heroes of the Storm, Smite, um, there's probably four other games that are in that genre. Um, you all, all of that love has birthed from Dota, Defense of the Ancients, which started as a mod on, was it Warcraft 2? Warcraft 3. Warcraft 3. Uh, started as a mod on Warcraft 3 and then became an official release. And then Dota 2 came out uh, also many years ago now, which was an official sequel to it. Um but all of those kind of going down the lane, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the genre, but... MOBAs. MOBAs, there we go. Uh, which I used to play a lot of, uh, actually, and I have played less recently. I used to love League of Legends. But, like, if you've played any of those games, it's because you had spent some time with Defense of the Ancients and Warcraft 3 because it was all birthed out of that. I don't even... Do you know the stats on who created the that mod and where that came from it dota is a mod from warcraft 3 it started off as yeah because warcraft 2 did have a world editor that allowed you to make your own maps make your own things i remember doing that when i was a kid and you could certainly do the same thing with warcraft 3 uh the very first version of defense of the ancients was released in 2003 by kyle summer who goes by wow. the alias Yule, E-U-L. And it was based on a previous StarCraft scenario known as, known as Aeon of Strife. Oh, right, of course. Yeah, So and, and it was made before Frozen Throne came out, the original one. Got and, it. yeah, no, I remember Dota in particular being such a huge phenomena um, because, well, one, I remember being in college and my roommate just playing so much Dota. Like, he freaking loved it. And I'm like, what is this? Oh, it's a thing based on Warcraft 3. I was like, and like that, you've lost me. And, <laughs> but I remember also there was a whole, like, weird electro club song about Dota that was not in English that a couple of my friends were absolutely obsessed with. So every time I think of MOBAs, Dota... Uh, League of Legends, Heroes of the Storm, any of those, that song gets in my head, and I don't know any of the words <laughs> because they're not in English. So sure. I, I also need to look that up. But like it's the, the, the music video starts with a whole sketch of a mom opening up a door into a room full of like friends on laptops and like talking to, yelling at them in their languages, just like, why don't you ever do anything? All you do is sit here and play Dota all day long, all night long, Dota, Dota. And he just starts singing the song, and she like just backs away, and it turns into a whole thing. I mean, it sounds very of that time for sure. Very much um, so. And it's funny, like, uh, I didn't play a ton of custom maps on Warcraft. I didn't play a ton of Warcraft until World of Warcraft, to be honest. I was more into StarCraft. And right. I played a lot of custom maps on StarCraft. The big thing I remember playing on StarCraft back then was there were um, RPGs created within the StarCraft uh mission editor and yeah and world editor and like i played a lot of dragon ball z rpgs using starcraft models and like it didn't look anything like dragon ball z but like the character names the narrative there was story uh it was really wacky and like i was always very impressed that you could create your own stories using those map editors and I have limited experience with warcraft 3 i did play a little bit of it i played dota 
uh, for sure. My biggest experience with MOBAs was long after Dota with League of Legends and then Heroes of the Storm after that. Mm -hmm. um, but I had friends who were obsessed with that game. And I remember hearing the term MOBA for a long time and not like having any clue uh, what they were talking about. And it wasn't until my friend Brian introduced me to League of Legends. He's like, oh, yeah, this is like the next evolution of Dota. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Is that a what is a Dota? Yeah. I don't understand. Yeah, and, and and it's good that it actually got a genre title, multiplayer online battle arena, rather than just being a Dota. Yeah. And a lot of genres have moved past that, but not all of them. Well, sure. And, like, uh, again, you know, it is not uncommon for genres of games to have the game title in it, like your Metroidvanias. Although, again, my favorite version of that is the Where the Fuck Do I Go game, just yes. because it's very descriptively accurate. Um, right. And so easily these could have been called Dota games, but they're not. And they they got their own term. And, like, they've evolved, too. A lot of them started it, like, the original Dota was top-down, in your lane, you know, walking along this map with minions trying to take down towers and stuff. But the later versions, like a game like Smite, puts it into the third person. So you're in the lane. The mechanics are still the same as a MOBA, but instead of being watching it from above and clicking through, you're moving as if it were almost a third person shooter, but still with the same kind of strategy, which is very interesting to me. Yeah, th those are boundaries that got blurred in around that time of real-time strategy games that then evolved into MOBAs. The thing of, like, you're not just a big way up in the sky, here are your little units. It Like, let's get a little more cinematic with it. And being able to do yeah. that then evolved into, yeah, here's, it goes from here are your armies to here is your hero. Yeah, and, like, the Warcraft 3 was the big proponent of that, is, like, besides just having the armies that were hero characters like Arthas, who drove these you know, these missions forward. And that birthed a lot of the idea of creating these different heroes who had different stats and you would control that hero instead of controlling these massive armies. Yeah, it, it's almost as if Warcraft 3 was, I, I know it was, a, a huge public step forward for the real-time strategy genre. And it's like that kind of uh, micro versus macro that it did by giving you heroes. Blizzard took that and made World of Warcraft where it's, it's Warcraft, but now you're controlling one unit all the time. And then the fan base went, but what if this? It's yeah. like, here's, well, here's the cannon, here's the fanon. Sure. And, like, you know, StarCraft II tried to emulate a similar thing, but I feel like, I mean, I don't consider StarCraft II a failure. I don't think Blizzard does either. But it definitely yeah. didn't impact me the same way the first starcraft game did and i think that was never gonna happen right because even though starcraft one had some hero characters and had an in-depth narrative what starcraft 2 was always going to build on warcraft 3 not starcraft 1 because that was the most recent game with heroes and a massive narrative that they made yeah it would have been foolish and for them not to do that Right. And so I think while I love the, the cutscenes, I love the voice acting, like I love the narrative of StarCraft 2, the unfortunate truth is that it just doesn't play like StarCraft 1. And it, it couldn't, right? There's no way. It's like the people complaining about Diablo 3 not playing like Diablo 2. It, it can't. Like It can't. You, because then it's not a new game. It's that old game. You have to make changes. You have to progress. You have to create new systems to make these games play differently and play better question mark um, well, also and it's because, not going to resonate with everybody and also because i mean historically at least blizzard titles released so spaced out yeah that yeah if, if they're like only iterative developments on the previous one then you're 12 years too late pretty much and like they've been good with live updates for stuff but i think what made dota really interesting for fans of warcraft 3 but who maybe wanted something different is that dota reshaped the focus in a way that blizzard probably might have never done at that time now of course the irony now is that blizzard has their own moba heroes of the storm which i play a lot yep which takes a lot from what came before dota you know they still try and put their original spin on it and of course it's all the blizzard original characters Mm -hmm. um, now, actually, Heroes of the Storm is starting to create their own characters within the world of Heroes of the Storm that have no game origin outside of it, which is interesting. They're Kingdom Harding, Harding it. A little bit. But what's really funny is that, again, they created a game 
that might not have ever existed without this fan creation that was built within their game, which is un- endlessly fascinating to me. Oh, yeah, and it's it's funny how there are ideas, genres, whatever, that they don't belong to any one person, they don't belong to any one franchise, but it is very funny when the wheel turns and comes back to where it started in a strange way like that. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, because, I mean, we were talking about it last episode, how, you know, a, bl- a little blue hedgehog isn't the only character that can go fast from one uh, spot to another in a platformer. But it, it's it's so inextricably linked, and while people were waiting for a so-called good Sonic game to come out for a long time, there were other things that could happen and do and be. And some of that ended up coming back to Sonic. And so folks worked and developed and used the tools that were provided like world editors in warcraft 3 made an entirely new experience which then well ended up coming back to blizzard eventually because it's not like they returned it or went you can have this back now it's well here's what's out in the world and anybody can develop on the idea it's pretty cool yeah and for the fact that you know dota 2 exists as a standalone game as its own game that's mm-hmm. not made by Blizzard as far as I know, um, like, is also really interesting, right? Because Blizzard could have shut it down, right? They could have seen that this game exists and it's mm-hmm. within their their structure and been like, well, this is too big and it's taking away for why we made this game. But the reality was that's why Blizzard made that game is so people could do that. The same way, you know, nowadays uh, w- with Skyrim, for example, they released the dev tools on Steam and said, here... These are the tools we use to make Skyrim, make your own mods for Skyrim. And we got incredible story changes and updates and adjustments and creations, whole new expansions created by fans using the exact tools that they used. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is, that is the key point right there. Uh, when the fan base, when the players, when amateurs, when semi pros are given the tools that, can be utilized within that framework you know you don't have to build your engine you don't even have to build your assets here is just here's the lego bin have the run of the lego store and some people will make some goofy things out of that some people won't make much and some people will make art you could not conceive of and it that's not exclusive to to skyrim or to to warcraft 3 i mean we have our, a second Super Mario Maker. We have so many other games that are are built on that, and it's wonderful what people make. And it's where you get experiences like this. Now, I mean, not all of them turn into a fully independent franchises or something that can be sold. I know that there's an infinite amount of glory and genius in the Mario Maker community that I haven't seen or experienced any of it. But people have even been able to use the tools of Super Mario Brothers and make shoot 'em ups and make Metroidvanias and to make puzzle games using only the tools available. And in fact, the limited tools of Super Mario Brothers. It's, it's remarkable. Well, yeah, I actually, I watch a... A Patrick Klepek, who's one of the, I think he's the editor in chief of Vice Games, but he definitely works at Vice Games, and uh, mm-hmm. he streams and he does Mario Maker mornings uh, three times a week, and he did nice. it when the first game came out, and he does it when the current game with the current game, and I've always watched him since way back then, and with the new game, like with the new updates, with the release of the uh, the Master Sword power ups, you can turn Mario into Link, and have a bunch of basic abilities as and Link, very much like, Link, not just he looks like him, like with the the mushrooms from the first game. Like, this is, and now you can make some Zelda. Have fun. Yeah. It's really crazy. Like, he played a genre of game within Mario Maker recently, which was just uh, spot the difference. Literally, it's two boxes with Mario backgrounds, and there's one minor difference between the two. And you pick the column to go up, uh, uh, like, on an elevator above the one you think is correct, and if you pick the right one, you survive and go on to the next area. If you pick the wrong one, there's like a bomb and you die or spikes and you die. Like, it, it's just, it's fascinating what people will think of that I could never, ever come up with. Like, creation tools like that to me just overwhelm me. Um, I like creating characters. I like creating personalized characters. 
but like creating worlds, stages, maps, like just goes over my head. It just seems too overwhelming because you have to start so small. It's why like Minecraft, I could never play by myself. Minecraft, I only played with friends because I could mostly only toil on small projects to keep my head around it while my friends would do the bigger picture, build structures, create elevators, make mine cart tracks, like, and that stuff is endlessly fascinating to me because I don't have the wherewithal to do it. It's just outside my skill set. And that's fine. It's one of the nice things about all the creation tools being given to the public is some people create all kinds of things and others will enjoy what is being created or a combination therein. For sure. I, I'm definitely in that same camp of I can make I can make encounters in a way. I like I can make small pieces. I haven't developed the the discipline, the what have you to to make a larger experience. When I first got Mario Maker for the Wii U, I definitely tried to make like a weird dungeon maze. And <laughs> I had a couple of really nice ideas, but this was like within two days of getting it. So I wasn't experienced in it at all. I may revisit that idea now when I get this for the Switch, but there was a couple of things that were definitely like either false floors or go this way, but now that uh, the coins led you this way, but now it's a dead end, but coins led you elsewhere as well. But it's, it's a lot of fun. And to kind of bring it back to the original concept of new franchises, new experiences, and a lot of it being derived from the tools be given to the public, um, in doing research for this episode, because we're it's 2020 and now we're doing research for this show. <laughs> yeah. um, God damn it, this wasn't the idea. No good. <laughs> it was supposed to be casual. <laughs> God damn it. God damn it. But <laughs> in, in looking it up and in researching it and like going off of my own memories and trying to find new things, um, I'm glad we started with MOBAs, which uh, were based off of a real time strategy game. The vast majority of Mods made good, I suppose, are based in first-person shooters. Mm -hmm. And that one is funny because you can kind of trace it back. It's one of these, uh, there is no one true parent to that idea, to to, to any of that. Uh, a vast majority of these come from Half-Life, and I want to talk about that in a second. But you can trace it back and trace it back and trace it back. And honestly... Um, it probably goes back further, but for me, the point where it's like, ah, this makes sense as a as a starting point in evolution is Doom. Mm -hmm. Now, Doom, there's all kinds of memes that could be made about it, and it's a game. You know what? It was the last first-person shooter that I played seriously. <laughs> I, I remember having the ultimate Doom on my Macintosh, and every now and again, I'd turn God Mode off, but I loved playing that game. And... One of the things that I enjoyed back then was there was a, a heavy uh, community of folks making custom levels. And they would be saved in a, a proprietary, not proprietary, but a, a specific format. You know, it's not dot .zip, it's not dot .text, it's dot .wad, W-A-D. So you could go online and get wads for Doom. And there were entire... Uh, campaigns there were entire like sets of levels that people made there were further releases that came later that were built on really really well done levels that then be uh people were brought on officially uh the whole final doom which was released for consoles and i believe also pc which was a whole series of episodes of yeah uh, that was developed by team tnt and it was it, like it, it pulled a few things from Doom Two. It was, and these things were called Mega Wads, that were like thirty-two level sets, uh, called TNT Evolution and the Plutonia Experiment, and those became retail games. And from there, you had all of these other first-person shooters, which were once called Doom clones, and thankfully they got they moved past that. Um, and don't get me wrong, I grew up watching Invader Zim. The word Doom is inherently funny to me. <laughs> so I, I have no problem saying Doom as much as possible. Have you heard the good word of Doom? Doom. But from there, we got all of the 
all sorts of different franchises that people then continued to make levels for or make mods for. Uh, probably one of the most infamous or successful or whatever you want to call it uh, deviations is, of course, Counter-Strike. For sure. Which it was that kind of thing of it, it, it's rather funny when you think of, uh, I mean, Doom. Yeah, like big crazy run around, big gun shoot, all things. But it was mystical and demonic and sci-fi and everything else. And so you got stuff like Quake and a Hexen and Blood and and then Half-Life, which the vast majority of mods and things are pulled from. And I think that's because Half-Life was, if not the first, the first notable cinematic first-person shooter. And so having to do that, they had a lot more assets to tell the story. It wasn't just me, my guns, and the things I'm going to shoot them at. <laughs> right. There, there were other assets. And so Counter-Strike was no sci-fi, no nothing. Military shoot guns go. And you know what? People love it. Well, yeah, it's funny. Counter-Strike takes me back to a very particular time uh, that younger gamers may not understand. But there was a time where not everyone had powerful uh, cable internet connections in their own home. Sometimes you had dial-up and couldn't really play games online with your friends easily because of how slow everything was. Um, Kids, did you ever get down with the 56K? <laughs> um, and so, like, what Counter-Strike reminds me of, because I still, to this day, actually never played any of the Half-Life games, which I know is a sin and is on my path to correct this year in my year of the first-person shooter, which I'll have an update for later, which, funnily enough, will come back to Doom. Um, but Counter-Strike was one of the first multiplayer first-person shooters I ever played because I played them in LAN cafes, with friends of mine in Brooklyn, for those not in the know, because uh, I'm an old man, uh, land cafes were essentially just computer shops that also had an area, uh, sort of like a tabletop gaming shop, where they had computers pre-set up, and you and your friends could pay for time to sit and play multiplayer games together in a room. Um, Honestly, those do still kind of exist, just not a ton of them in New York City. There's a few. Yeah. And, and they're about, but yeah, th there was... It felt like there was a time where they popped up everywhere. everywhere. Like I felt like every every uh, major intersection in and all around New York had one of those. Um, yeah, maybe maybe the tri-state area just had a weird vogue, and we're separate from the rest of you. It, it, but it's possible. That's the tri-state area. We're weird. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I would go there to play a variety of games with my friends, and one of the big ones that I didn't really know a lot about, but they liked playing, was Counter-Strike. And, I, again, my experience with first-person shooters, if you listen to our Gaming Resolutions episode, is that I didn't really like them because I wasn't very good at them. Playing this with my friends, I had a lot of fun because we didn't take it super seriously, and some funny moments would happen in a similar way that I would play fighting games, not very competitively. And when goofy stuff happened, we all got a laugh. But like Counter-Strike is so tied to those memories for me because we played so much of it back then. And like I can see the map. I can hear the sounds. Like We played so much of that game. And I feel like if I went back to it now, I might enjoy it more only because... I've developed some of my skills. I still don't think I'm particularly great at first-person shooters, but I think that I found a way to enjoy them in a different way. Also, the difference with Counter-Strike is that it was competitive, but it was team-based, and the matches went pretty quickly. So even if you were on the losing team, you moved on to the next thing. Uh, something I've talked about with other third-person and first-person shooters that I do like, like Overwatch and Splatoon, is that the matches move quick enough that if you're getting pummeled, it's fine. You know, it also is how I found my love of Team Fortress 2 is because there's so much comedy attached to that game that even if I was losing or playing terribly, it was still fun to see these ridiculous characters interact. Um, what's really interesting about Counter-Strike, though, like Jeff was alluding to, is that it was a mod for Half-Life. It was designed uh, by um, Gooseman and Cliffy, or Cliff, uh, which were their usernames back then, and it was eventually acquired by Valve to then be released later as Counter-Strike Go, which was like one of their biggest releases and reshaping of this series. Um, but it started as a mod for Half-Life. You know, Half-Life gave you the tools, like a lot of Valve products and stuff on Steam, to play with and to mod with. And um, 
they created this giant fan base around a game that was built out of another game. And it was one of the first times, I think, that first-person shooters were built that way on that scale. We had Quake and we had some other games that had customization, but it was nothing like what Valve and Half-Life provided for something like Counter-Strike. Oh, yeah. I mean, Team Fortress started as a mod for Quake. Yes, correct. And and it's, and it's fun because I feel like Team Fortress was one of the pioneers of class-based first-person shooters for sure there'd be no overwatch without team fortress for sure yeah thanks team fortress uh <laughs> actually you know what i should say that more reverently i don't know um it's yeah no th- this was definitely a this topic was my idea and i wanted to talk about it and i want to do research on it and i wanted to share it but it's also a man most mods are made on games and genres that i just don't jive with <laughs> but I also am endlessly fascinated by it, so I'm happy that I can... This is one where normally we like sharing these things based on personal experiences and whatnot. This is... I watched other people really get into this. Yeah. about as close as I got. I mean, yeah, it's funny. Like, at first, I was also very distant from a lot of these competitive shooters. I think why I've played some of them so much was not because I particularly like them, because I like playing them with my friends. And Team Fortress 2 is very much that. Also, it was free for the longest time, or not free, but really cheap. Now it's free, uh, or you can pay for it and get a bunch of hats and customizations and yada, yada, yada transactions. But Right. And no, and definitely Half-Life in Valve's releasing of Source, yes. of the Source engine, it's allowed a great deal of of development and offshoots and creations and even creations into things that aren't necessarily... Like, okay, Counter-Strike feels as though it is a distillation of a certain kind of first-person shooter and in team-based tactics and all kinds of stuff, which, you know what? That's fantastic. Games like that should exist for the people who like to play those games. And that's something that I, I, I feel I speak for, but I don't often speak for in the, like, sheer diversity of games out there and, like, the the micro and macro development of uh, the game experience Stuff like Counter-Strike and things like all of the different mods, whether they become commercial products or not, they lend themselves to a community finding, oh, this, is, this isn't this is for 100% of us, but the 23% that get it, like this scratches an itch nothing else could reach. Sure. And I, th- I think also the genre of competitive shooter and team-based shooters couldn't have grown the way they did without these kinds of mods and the availability of these tools, right? Like, I'm sure oh, yeah, we let's, can trace— Let's think about the fact that— yeah, I was, I was, Let's just think about the fact that esports is built on these genres. Yeah, for sure. These two genres particularly also is where a lot of customization came in because people wanted to curate experiences that they wanted. Um, and they were emulating things that developers themselves had done. I mean, you look at— uh, GoldenEye for the N64, which probably is responsible for that next step for modern shooter beyond Doom. And then they released Perfect Dark later because Rare, who helped make GoldenEye, couldn't get the Bond license again, but wanted to make another shooter. So they took everything from GoldenEye and just put a new coat of paint on it. Like, the gameplay is identical. The gunplay is identical. It's a brand new narrative, a brand new character. But essentially, they modded their own game. You know, and then when Perfect Dark 2 or Perfect Dark whatever came out on Xbox later, that's when it grew and changed and for the better or the worse is for you to decide. But like developers themselves have always, if they have a toolkit that works and they want to get something out in a short period of time to keep interest high, they'll often mod their own stuff. I mean, look at uh, Majora's Mask versus Ocarina of Time. Like effectively, Majora's Mask is a mod of Ocarina of Time but just done by the same developers. They took something that worked, they built something in that same toolkit, but with a brand new story, different mechanics, but they still use the same basic tools to do it in a shorter period of time than it would take to say to make a brand new game from scratch. Yeah, and this is something that often becomes a a point of contention or discussion for, for fans. And the idea of, okay, there, there's the argument of a sequel is too much like the first one or too not like the first one. The thing of, well, they didn't develop anything new or they're still using the same assets from so long ago or they're, you know, it still plays the same. And a lot of 
very ambitious bedroom developers and and game makers. Not all of them, but there is a certain selection, let's say, mm-hmm. that it's like, I'm going to make everything from scratch, and I'm going to make my own game engine, too. And that sounds really good if you don't understand what a game engine is. Where a game engine is a whole bunch of commands and settings and everything else that it's not you build an engine and then you throw stuff in it and game comes out which i don't think everybody feels that way but i'm sure there's a couple of people that think like that (laughs) and conjecture whatever but there's also the notion of these things need to be updated they need to be maintained and if something is a more readily available or more uh accessible or popular engine it's going to be updated And so you can make your game in some other game's engine, and it will be completely uh, indistinguishable. The the fact that using Half-Life, people have been able to make games like Dear Esther, which is not a first-person shooter. It's, It's a, you know... It's a walking simulator. It's a storytelling game. You're able to create things like Antichamber, which is just a trippy puzzle platformer in the first person you're able to make hack and slash games you're able to make chivalry medieval warfare and there's a and a lot of this we're talking about half-life and source engine and everything else and that's great but there's a whole nother uh franchise that we haven't mentioned yet unreal yep and the sheer amount of games that are first person shooters and are nothing near a first person shooter you're not even in the first person anymore that is built on the unreal engine yep like you like look up what's in the Unreal Engine and it's it's a laundry list and that's fantastic because it allows it frees you from having to solve every problem. It allows you to make what you want to be making, make it an entirely yours. It's not like you have to you're not paying a tith in a tax, I don't think. And on on using it, on utilizing it. But it means you solve problems when you run into them. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. The wheel's already turned by the engine. Well done. Well done. Thank you. I see where you went with that. I, oh, I, I didn't have I didn't have that plan. I just landed on it. And you know what? <laughs> um well yeah, and I mean also talking back going back a bit to Valve, like talking we haven't talked about another major mod project that became a full fledged series that has had two full entries which is portal which we've talked about before Mm -hmm. like created by a fan using those tools and then got an official release under valve and then of course the original creator i believe left before the second one was made because she had only wanted to make the first one um yeah but i think that one was also like started as a college project yeah like and like here's look what i created this puzzle game within the source engine And Val was like, that's mighty fine. We would like to make this a full-fledged game. Here's a lot of more, probably a decent amount of money. I wouldn't say a lot of money, probably. Um, Yeah, here's funding. And, and like, it became, I mean, it's one of my favorite puzzle games of all time. And it's first person. You know, a, a genre, as I've explained before, that I've always bounced off of, even if I've played a lot of it. And so I think what's really fascinating, and to jump on what you were saying before with the Unreal Engine and Unreal Tournament, is like, all of these games and companies built off of other things that came before. But what's really interesting about the fan creations is that they are just utilizing these tools in a way that maybe people who've used these tools for ages wouldn't always think to do. I mean, it's why I don't understand why some other companies don't release their dev tools more often, because I guarantee the reason that, um, you know, Todd Howard omnipotent as he is released the dev tools for Skyrim is because they could get ideas all that data they see it all of the designs they see it and they can see all of that stuff because you're creating within their tool set they'll have access to it it's to find inspiration or to find people to hire I mean they've hired people you know plenty of people have gotten hired through this process because they see what you're capable of and by lowering the barrier of entry, there are folks who nev- would never even consider themselves designers in one way or another, finding fewer and fewer excuses to just make something and being amazed by what they create. And that lights a fire, which then leads to them becoming the sort of people that 
yeah, we'll get hired by the bigger team, by the bigger company, not just uh, creating an entire game or franchise on their own, but the thing like, I saw those levels you made. I saw that mod you made. Oh, my God. Like, we'd like to hire you. Like, those are... The, there's... There is a difficult conversation about intellectual property and what is proprietary or not. But I feel in a lot of ways there can be far more good than bad when people can tinker with what's behind the scenes in a safe environment. And releasing the dev tools is a great way to do that. For sure. And I agree with you. I think more companies, I, I, I feel more companies should do it. I don't run a game company, so, you know, this is me for my armchair. Right, of course. And, like, you know, you met, you mentioned Mario Maker before. Like, it's probably not the exact tools they use to create Mario games, but I guarantee it's a more fun-sized version of it. And think about, and I don't think I'm the first person to say this, but I will definitely ape probably something more intelligent people have stated before. Think about all of the game developers who are getting their first crack at discovering if they like developing games using one of the longest-running video game series in history in a tool provided for them by the company. I mean, they have to buy it, but like... I could never even put my head around developing a game as a kid because I just it was like magic to me, right? I press a button, a game turns on. But now you can look at you can watch someone 5 years old create a really intelligent and well-made Super Mario level and they can sit there and go, "Oh, maybe this is a thing I can do" and then go on from there. It's just not oh, a yeah. thing that existed before and I think it's really fascinating and excites me for game development a decade or two decades from now. When people in interviews are saying, yeah, I got my start playing Super Mario Maker or from using the Source Engine, like things that didn't exist when we were kids that now exist that younger gamers can use to figure out if that's a thing they want to do. Yeah. And these sort of tools and these sort of creations and these sort of environments have existed for a long time in the PC realm. For sure. And and they will continue to do so. And fantastic. And it's great that things like Mario Maker are doing that for consoles, doing that for handhelds. I mean, look, uh, compare RPG Maker for the <laughs> PS1 to Mario Maker, even the first one. And I, know that, and I know they've been making RPG Maker games for years, and there's so many versions. I'm just thinking of the first console release versus something more recent. Yeah. It's, it's night and day. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember being so excited for RPG Maker 3, I think, or 4, whichever one was on the PS2. I was like, oh, yeah. this is going to be so much fun. And like sitting with my friend trying to create stuff. And it was just such a slog, which of course it was, right? Because you're trying to make a complex story, mechanics, and a bunch of other mm -hmm. things. Like it's not going to be easy. Um, but Nintendo found a way to make it super approachable. And uh, albeit a little easier to make a Mario game than it is an RPG just because of the directions those developments head. You know, one is in-depth story, the other is jumping on Goombas. Not to say that Mario games don't have story, but they are definitely less in-depth, I think we can all agree, than your average JRPG. Um, as as well as, like, the you are not choosing the look of things. You're going, I need something to walk in a straight line. I want this. I need something that flies. I want this. Whereas RPG Maker, it's, yes, but how do you want your treasure chest to look? Yeah. You do know. you want it to play a sound? <laughs> Take your time. Yeah. You vary that. It, it's very much in, in opposite directions of each other. But, like... But also with the success of Mario Maker and the success of putting Zelda themes in Mario Maker. Like, I don't know that we'll get a full-fledged Zelda Maker. Um, but that said, imagine if we did get a Metroid Maker or a Sonic Maker. Like, any of those things. Just the kinds of things people could create. Like, I feel like Super Mario Maker is a stepping stone to whatever the next great custom modded platformer game might be like someone might be inspired to create their own revolutionary platformer using the elements that mario maker gives you access to or by people kind of finding the corner cases and and you know tip tiptoeing around the edge of what is possible in those things creating something new mm -hmm. i would feel very remiss in this episode not mentioning the stanley parable okay for sure which it which is a a half a Half-Life uh, derived game that is a storytelling game that used the, the the mundane quality of office assets in that game to tell a strange story about free will and choice. 
yep. that is w- one that I absolutely adore and love. And it was made in a first-person engine. There are no guns. There is no shooting. There is none of that. Much in that that, that whole Dear Esther thing, much in all those others. But the notion of like, well, what can I add? Ah, narration. That one thing completely changes the game experience. And it having different environments uh like sandboxes for people to build in whether it's building yeah whether it's building a mario level whether it's building a metroidvania whether it is i don't know whatever there's and there's a lot of games that are built on being that there are dungeon maker games there are creation based games but when they are ones that are derived from known quantities you get different people and you get a very different kind of thing i mean something that probably fuels the Mario Maker community is all of the amazing Mario speedrunners and uh, just high-level Mario players on Twitch streaming Mario Maker levels, like blind stuff or people sending them stuff. And if you have to learn an entirely new game just to, like, then play what goes on, there's there's something lost. There's It's harder to get the momentum going, but we know Mario. For sure. I think that's a good note to end on. Um, of course, we didn't speak about every kind of fan-created content that has become full-fledged. Um, we know, did games. not mention Fortnite. We did not. I did not want to get into that. That is its own thing as well with a lineage. And way above <laughs> way yeah. above our pay Maybe grade. Maybe one day we'll talk about Fortnite, but <laughs> yeah, it's way above our pay grade. That, um, needs, that needs episodes. Yeah, for sure. And also, I'd probably want to bring on someone more experienced at playing Fortnite than me because I've not played a lot of it. Agreed. Uh Hell, we could. Pr- I could probably bring on either of my nephews to talk at length about why that game is great, uh, quite coherently, I think. Um, but beyond uh-huh. that, um, as always, we want to know your experiences with fan-created content, your experiences with these games, if you've played them, why you loved them, why you didn't love them. Uh, before we wrap up this episode, uh, I think for the foreseeable future this year, we're going to continue to do our updates on our gaming resolutions. I think it's a fun little segment for the end of the episodes, and also because I like tracking our progress. Also, if you want to hear that progress in real time, you can go to our Discord server, which you can find a permanent link to at certainpov.com. Jeff and I are both updating our progress there, complete with screenshots and some discussion. Um, And if you, too, are setting out to complete your gaming goals this year, please share them with us there. We would love to hear about it. It's great to to hear what you're working on, what you're doing, what what old games, what new games, what experiences you're you're having and sharing. We want to hear about them. We like sharing ours with you. Yeah, we want to hear about the your favorite mod, your favorite mod that you wish uh, was made into a bigger game, your favorite fan engine of a previously established thing. Did, did you play a lot of Zelda Classic? I played a lot of Zelda Classic. <laughs> but we want to hear about it because this is a conversation. Thank you for being a part of it. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And happy gaming.